Okay, so if you're learning a new language or you're just picking up language for the first time, especially if you're familiar to programming, you might be thinking, how do I approach actually learning the things that I need to know in order to solve problems in this new language? And a really great way of doing that is code golfs um, or code katas, as I guess is the new way of saying golf because people think kata is cooler than golf now. I don't know. Anyway, Code Wars is a really cool site for that. Uh, I like it a lot. I've used a lot of sites like this, but basically what it does is it gives you challenges with instructions uh, with problems to be solved in a variety of languages. Uh, as you can see, you have all kinds of options. Um, this particular puzzle, you could use Python, you could use Rust, you could use Java, whatever you want, that kind of thing. But it's a really great, great way to, um, if you're familiar with one language and you know how to do something in one language, you don't know how to do it in another language. You just want to become familiar with, okay, what's the name of that function? What's that library that I'm supposed to use? What's the syntax for doing things with collections, that kind of thing. It's a really good way to get started. So I'm gonna go ahead and solve this one. I've actually solved this one before, but I really, really like it. I think it's a good example of how to use the site. Uh, I'm just gonna kind of give you a, a look into it. Maybe it'll be useful to you. So here's this puzzle over on the left-hand side. As you can see, we have instructions. If we were to set up a tic-tac-toe game, we would want to know whether the board's current state is solved. So we'll write a function to do that, basically. So uh, if you've never played tic-tac-toe before, obviously you've got this sort of nine-cell grid, and you're going to put take turns putting X's and O's until somebody gets three in a row. That's kind of how it works. Uh, and this is how they're sort of representing a game board. So if you were to divide, you know, have three columns and three rows, uh, and every one of those has a cell inside of this 2D array here. Uh, this is what the game state looks like. Uh, and this is what they want our function to return. So given something like this, given this game state, if the board's not finished and nobody has won, so there are still places left to go, return minus one. Uh, if X's wins, return one. If O's wins, returns two. Uh, and if it's a draw, return zero. Uh, and they also mentioned that these spaces here. So a zero is an empty space. Nobody's gone there yet. A one is an X and a two is an O. Um, knots and crosses, I guess, basically. So these spaces here are still empty. Uh, looks like X took the middle space. Maybe X went first. Who knows? Uh, looks like X did go first because X has three spaces taken and two only has, um, O's only has two spaces taken, but no big deal. So Given this game board where zeros are empty, ones are X's, twos are O's, uh, if nobody is one and the game's not finished, return minus one. If X is one, return one. If two, or O has one, excuse me, return two. And then if it's draw, return zero. That's the basic premise of this particular exercise. So how can we solve this? Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you could do that. Um, a lot of people just brute force it, right? Uh, Tic-tac-toe is not a very hard game to complete. Uh, it's pretty easy to think, okay, well, there's three ways to win that way, three ways to win that way, and then the diagonals, right? So you've got, um, you could get three in a row in three rows, or in three columns, or in either of the two diagonals, right, going up here. So one way you could do it is to brute force it, say, if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else, for every single possibility, so that's three plus three plus two. So eight, I guess there's eight ways to win in a game of tic-tac-toe, uh, if I'm doing my mental math right. Um, but there are some more clever ways that you could solve it. Um, I'm going to show you a way that I kind of like to solve it. When the game is represented this way, it has some characteristics that we can use to our advantage. For example, we're storing the states of all of these cells as numbers which we can do arithmetic on. They're not strings, um, they're not characters, even though in some languages you can do easy character arithmetic. Um, but the fact that zero is an empty space and then one and two are, are different and we can actually do arithmetic with them, that's gonna make our lives a lot easier here. So let me just go ahead and get started. I'm gonna bang out the solution. They have a really nice editor over here on this side. Doesn't matter what language you're using, if you save this, uh, it actually runs the output over here on the left-hand side. Uh, and the output that it's running, it's getting from here. So they actually wrote unit tests for you, which is really nice. So you can just get started coding. So they've got unit tests down here. 
Over on the left-hand side, the output of those tests is getting spat out. You can see what your compiler is saying, what you need to fix. Uh, and once you make the test pass, basically, you can attempt to solve. Uh, and what that does is it actually throws more unit tests at you. And it does a little bit of randomization as well. So you can't just write a solution that bangs out uh, answers to all of the tests you have below. It actually has some randomness, so you have to solve the problem. So that's one of the reasons I really like this one. So let's go ahead and do this. So I'm going to store the results of all of the turns not really turns, the results of all of the different possible ways of winning inside of my own data structure. Uh, I'm going to say that's R. And I'm going to make R a vector. So this R, this is going to be the result of the game. And in it, I'm going to store the results of every single row or column or diagonal. So basically, if there are three X's in the top row, of a tic-tac-toe board. I'm going to store that as my first value in here. Um, if there are three O's in the third column, I'm going to store that in this list as well. And the way that I'm actually going to compute those wins is multiplication. So if you look at our instructions here, they've made our lives really, really easy, like I said, by using these numbers, because if you multiply the three in a row numbers together, you're going to get the same answer every single time if there are three in a row. Obviously, if there are three ones, you're going to get one if you multiply them all together. If there are three twos, you're going to get eight. If there's a zero in there somewhere because somebody hasn't gone there, you're going to get zero, which says that there are still empty spaces. We can use the properties of the data structure that we're using for the game board to our advantage. So uh, let's go ahead and start with the diagonals. If you're confused by how I'm solving this in my head, maybe it'll make sense when I throw some code down on here. So let's say uh, to do the first diagonal, I'm going to say board, and I'm going to index the board, right? Board's being passed up here. It's a 2D array, uh, three values in every array of three arrays. And I'm going to go ahead, I guess, excuse me, I'm sorry, there's slices in Rust for Rust people who are commenting right now. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pick my diagonals first. So I'm going to index 0, 0. That's my top left cell. And I'll multiply that 1, 1. And then board 2, 2. So this is me determining this right here, this 0, 1, 0. Now we can tell from looking at this example that that's not a win yet that's going to evaluate to zero when I multiply all of these together. So I can say with confidence that nobody has won that particular method of winning, right? Nobody has used that diagonal to win the game. And I'm going to actually store this inside of my uh, vector here. So I'm going to do r.push, and I'm going to save that. Uh, awesome. So now I actually have my first solution being stored inside of this vector here. Now, you might be thinking ahead, OK, well, how are we going to check this vector for these solutions to determine whether or not somebody has won the game? And that's going to be easy based on uh, the properties of the game board. I'm going to show you that in a bit. So first of all, let me go ahead and add my next diagonal here, which is going to be index row 2 column, or excuse me, row 0 column 2. Right, if we start counting at zero, so I'm going to do row zero, column two, and then one one is still in the middle, and then two zero is going to be my next entry there. So this is this diagonal that goes from two to one to one right here. So now I've accounted for who has won this slot, who has placed enough of their values in this diagonal row to win the game. Now we have to get a little bit more creative. And actually, I can go ahead and run this and see what this does. Now, none of my unit tests are passing because I'm not doing anything useful with this whatsoever. I'm not returning any values. The compiler is angry. Let me go ahead and just return something at the end so we can see it run some tests. Here we go. Now you can see what the test output looks like. So as you're writing code over here, save it. See what it says. With this board, I expected one, which I guess is one to win, but I got minus one. That makes sense because we're only returning minus one. Why did it expect one to win? Because one had the whole first row all to itself, and it won the game. So 
let's keep going over here now that we know what that output is going to kind of look like. So for this, I need to start thinking about my rows and columns. Obviously, that means that I'm going to do some kind of iteration. I could just enumerate all of my board rows like this. The only reason I did the diagonals like this is because it's a little janky with loops to do diagonals. It's just easier for me to write it. But I can save myself a step. So let's say three times we're going to look at the rows and three times we're going to look at the columns. So I'm going to say for i in uh, 0, dot, dot, 3. So i is going to be 0, then 1, then 2. And I'm going to start a loop with that. And I can check my syntax in case I'm coming from another language and I don't know what a loop is supposed to look like in Rust. And the compiler is going to be friendly and tell me, oh, yeah, that looks fine, but you're not using i anywhere. So go fix that. Looks good. <laughs> OK, now let's go ahead and add some more results to our results list. So we're going to do r.push. And let's go ahead and start with, uh, let's start with the rows. So I'm going to index at i in this iteration, and then 0, and we're going to do board i1, and then we're going to do board i2. That's going to get me, for every iteration of this loop, a row. I'm going to get the 0th row, indexes 0, 1, and 2, right, for every column. And I'm going to get the first row, indexes 0, 1, 2, and then the second row, 0, 1, 2. And then I can repeat this and just change it up a little bit, swap these, 0i, 1i, and then 2i. Now I've got my columns, right? So every time I index, I'm going to say, OK, for the uh, 0th row, get column whatever. And for the first row, get column whatever. And then for the second row, get column whatever. So what I'm doing is. With this line on every iteration, I'm multiplying these, right? First row, second row, third row, or zero with rows, first row, second row. And then with this second line here, I'm saying, OK, I'm going to do this. So 0, 0, 2, and then 0, 1, 1, and then 1, 2, 0. So now, once that's finished, I will have 1, 2, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different ways to win tic-tac-toe stuffed into my results vector. That's fantastic because now I have the entire state of the winnings of the game stored inside of that vector. Now I can go ahead and save that. I know my test still isn't going to pass because I still haven't done anything useful with it. Um, but basically, uh, I've got everything that I need over here to start solving the problem. So let's go back to the instructions and look at how we're actually going to determine when this game is finished. So if nobody has won, we have to return minus one. And we're kind of defaulting to that right now because we don't know. We haven't even started looking at it yet. So let's ignore that for now. If x won, we're going to return a one. How do we know x won? We know x won if the product anywhere inside of our vector if the product of any of these came out to one because that means there were three ones in a row and remember everything in my vector is the product of three cells in a row so i can come down here and i can say uh let me see uh if we're going to do r dot contains at uh one and if r dot contains at one, I actually don't need this extra parentheses when we get rid Then we're going to return one. I'm just going to put my else at the bottom here for this minus one. OK. Now we're actually getting somewhere, because when I save and run this, you can see my tests are running. And it says expected 0 but got minus 1. I passed some tests already, because that 212 test is actually down here. That means that I returned minus one, solved this case, returned one, solved this case. Uh, but I got down here and I didn't actually solve it for zero, where uh, nobody won. It was a draw. So let's account for our other ways for this game to end. Uh, we can add an else if here. R that contains, and we're going to pass that a two, or excuse me, an eight, right? Because two times two times two is eight. That means that there were three twos in a row when I multiplied them together. 
So in that instance, I'm going to return a two. Uh, and then we'll save that. Haven't solved anything else because we're still not accounting for zeros. Go ahead and make this look a little bit better. Now let's go and let me see, what do we have to account for? Uh, the board's not finished and nobody has won yet. So there are empty spots. So it's not a minus one if nothing else has taken place. Basically what this means is if any of these multiplied to zero, we know there were zeros somewhere inside the rows and columns. So that's a really easy way for me to determine if there are still empty spaces left. So let's, instead of saying else, say else if it contains a zero and let's return zero. Then I'll put my minus one at the end. And I think that should actually be, oh, hang on, not quite there yet. What did it say? It said minus, oh, I picked these up. Minus one if we're not done yet, and then zero if it's a draw. And I'm just going to say else for zero because if nobody won and there's still, and there are no spaces left, it's just a draw. Uh, I don't actually have to go and check for that. I can just say else on that. Uh, so this should be it. This should be everything that we needed. And I didn't really do any brute forcing on this. I think this is as few, um, I guess, handwritten enumerations of the board as you can do. Maybe you can get clever with loops in here and somehow do something like this for the diagonals as well. But this is pretty easy. I'm just storing the state of the diagonal results and all the horizontal and vertical results. And then I'm just taking the product and I'm determining based on you know, the game's state, zeros, ones, and twos, what do those spaces look like? The relationship between those spaces can only evaluate to those numbers. So let me go ahead and attempt this. And it's going to run the big test list. There you go, random tests. Test passed. Awesome. So that's my solution. Uh, and I think that's pretty, uh, pretty simple. Now, if I want to, obviously, Code Wars says you can go and refactor and comment it and make it look nice for people. You've done your your duty, you've solved the problem, but if you want to clean it up a little before you publish it to people, you can do that there. But I'm going to go ahead and submit that. Uh, and it should take me, yep, here we go. I'm done. Uh, and now I get to look at other people's solutions next to my solution. Uh, and this is actually the cool thing about Code Wars, and this is why I like it better than any other Code Golf site. You get this sort by best practices and clever. Uh, and every solution is voted based on whether people think it's best practice or people think it's clever. And those two things are very rarely the same thing. Uh, and that's why I like looking at these because uh, sometimes I wanna see how somebody was clever. Look, this isn't very many lines here. Um, it looks like they're still enumerating all the different possible win states uh, in code. Oh, this is definitely enumerating all of them. Uh, I don't know if that's very clever, but it's it's highly ranked as clever. But anyway, you can vote. You know, you can determine. Yeah, I think that was a clever solution. You can compare it to yours uh, and see how it looks compared to your solution. There you go. Obviously, I have a lot more vertical lines than this guy. Um, but if you wanted to learn uh, what other people think is an appropriate way of solving that problem in that language you can do that by looking at best practices. If you are really good at the language and you just want to find out new tricks and shortcuts that you don't know about, you can do that by sorting by clever. So that's Code Wars uh, and how to solve tic-tac-toe uh, in Rust and pretty much any other language. This is just how I solve tic-tac-toe boards now. Um, I don't know why I like it so much. I've been interested in tic-tac-toe games ever since I figured out how to program. Maybe it's war games, but hopefully this helps. Hopefully this is a cool tool for you to learn new languages or get really good at languages that you're already kind of familiar with. It's also a lot of fun. Uh, it's a neat thing to do to just take a brain break. So uh, that's it. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Appreciate it.